Jan Leszczewski, my guest, playing um, Felix Mendelssohn's Variation Series um, live in our Q studio. God, the 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 contrast of that quite that frenetic um, peep part in the middle compared to the piece uh, at the end is 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 so stark, hey? It is, and that's the talent of of a good composer to be able to link dramatically opposite emotions and and create these contrasts. I think that also draws the audience in. What do you feel during that frenetic frenetic part? Because I have to say, I, I I was listening with my eyes closed as I try to do, and I looked up when you hit sort of that. Well, so can I, I think it's a fair to say because sort of the frenetic part of the piece of music. <laughs> what what do you feel in that moment? Because you your your whole body changed. You you tensed up a little bit. Your eyes widened. I felt like something inhabited you. <laughs> well, what what are you feeling in those in those moments? Well, so it's actually very simple to explain in in this particular moment because it's still the theme. So we have this very simple theme that I'm playing that that I'm demonstrating, but it's been blown out of proportion. And so the the challenge when you're actually playing it is to play all the notes, but <laughs> to remember that you're playing the theme within that. So that simple melodic line is still hidden uh, within all those notes. And so it's it's the concentration is is used to shape the music at that moment, to actually create something. Because I, I always find that the best performances, the, the ones that you really enjoy the most, are not when you're thinking about every detail, about what's going on, and, and struggling with the piano, fighting with, who knows, the, the audience, the atmosphere, yourself. But it feels like the music is, is coming out, and you're just a conduit, and you're shaping it. It's like you have a clay on a kiln, and you're just, you know, it's turning, and, and you're just shaping it, and it's coming out in these, in these fantastic shapes. And you don't actually have to uh, form it by hand and sort of struggle and knead it. It just comes, and it, it creates amazing things. And that's sort of the way you feel, I think, when you're playing. In, in, or, in order to get that feeling, I understand what you mean. Like, the music is sort of coming out of you. You're trying to distance yourself from the actual act of playing. Mm. And does that mean, um, well, how, how much practice into the actual notes of the piece of music need to happen for you to get there? To, the, the amount of practice, is, it's, it's a great uh, unanswerable question because, of course, all parents would love to know how much practice it takes to play the piano well. And I, I will say th the least possible. Um, I always practice as little as possible. Really? Why is that? Because you want to keep the music fresh. You want to enjoy it, right? See, that seems that seems uh, in contrast with what you were saying in order to lose yourself fully in it and have the music. I would think you need, would need to know it so well. So it's this magical, magical moment that you have to find that, that balance, that line, that you know it so well that, that it's a part of you, but you don't know it too well that it becomes boring uh, and uninteresting. And in some ways, one could argue that it's hard to ever come to the moment that it becomes boring, but... Even after a certain point of simply living with the music, if I'm playing a big tour and I have um, eight concerts in a row uh, with the same repertoire, sometimes night after night, sometimes you can keep that inspiration going. And sometimes by the end, you're losing a little bit. You become, uh, as, as a teacher of mine once said, you become a caricature of yourself. So you're trying to do what you know and you, you've sort of grown accustomed to and you, you think works, but but it's not true. It doesn't come from the heart anymore. And you're 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 just drawing... Uh, a vague picture of what it is. So if that's if that moment is what you're seeking out, I'm surprised you're not drawn more to improvisation. Well, I'm very happy and content in my little bubble of classical music. <laughs> I, I have found that um, it's a place I feel comfortable in, and there is so much to explore. It's amazing because as a pianist, you have an inexhaustible amount of repertoire to right. learn. Uh, if I was... I don't know, perhaps a horn player, maybe I would be more inspired to improvise because there's a rather finite amount of music written for solo horn. Yeah. Uh, but for the piano, I mean, every composer liked writing for this instrument, for my instrument, because it has all the possibilities. Uh, it, it can stand by itself. It can create all sorts of colors and emotions and uh, it can play loudly and softly and oh, you know all these things. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I'm very, very happy that you play the piano. <laughs> I'm very, very happy that you... But I'm, I guess what I was saying was, and I'm, and I, I'm, I'm not criticizing you at all, um, what, what I mean is that if the goal is to find that, that sort of moment, that sort of, sort of feeling on the inside for you, I, I'm, I'm heartened that you can find it through through composed music because I think so many people who are looking for that find it through sheer improvisation. I find it remarkable and 
ultimately kind of hap- I'm kind of happy about it that you can find <laughs> it in composed music from 200 years ago. Well, but it's it's like going to the theater uh, and the actors who really are the best own the script. It's part of them. They're not telling the story. They are the story. They embody it. And I think that's the same with the music. So you you want to reach that point that it's so comfortable that you're not struggling with the syntax of a sentence, but you're able to tell the story in such a way that that it's as if you were actually there in that moment. At just, I'm on the piano. I love that. So I, I can't help but notice there's some actual parallels between you and the composer we've been talking about, Felix Mendelssohn. You look the same. No, um, he, he was a gifted performer as a, as a child. You started performing when you were? About 14, 15. 14, 15 years old. He wrote his first pieces when he was, what, 12, 13 years old. Um, you had your first album, of course, as a teenager. Mendelssohn wrote his first concerto at the same, around the same age you are now. What are you, 21? I'm 24 now. Really, I'm very old. 20, you're, you're getting up there. <laughs> yes. Um, do you see yourself? Do you think about those connections? I think in music, the great thing really about about uh, forms of art like like this is that age has no meaning, or sh- I, I hope and I, I strive for that, because ultimately either it's good or it's not. And you can be after finishing a doctorate in piano and you can still play very poorly or a doctorate in composing and you can't write for any instrument for the life of you or you can be 14 or 15 and just innately be able to create something at such a high level does it ever feel like an albatross though being a a gifted young performer to be i remember i think i saw a documentary about you jan when you were like the cbc did a story on you when you were like 15 years old yeah Yeah, i watched it on a plane and but in, in all seriousness like is that ever something you have to wear or something you have to get past it's a very easy point of attraction for people because they like to quantify things. They like to say, you know, he's tall, he's blonde, he's young, and he plays the piano. You want to put sort of things that you can understand easily. And music isn't something. It's not like a sport that I'm the fastest at playing the piano. And it doesn't. You're pretty, you're pretty fast. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. pretty fast. <laughs> sure, I could. Th- if there was a competition, I would be game. Uh, and, <laughs> you're the Usain Bolt of. Uh, yeah. But it's not that easy, right? It's not about that. When you're on stage, it doesn't matter uh, if you're playing quickly or even how accurately you're playing. Yeah. It's it's about that unknown magical quality that I think one would say is talent, that gift that you have innately. Uh, that you were born with and you can't explain and you can't learn. And I'm very privileged and I feel very lucky to have that. But but it doesn't bother you? Like, uh, But I also know, and I know performers who, who say the same thing, but they also might go, God, I'm so tired of being called a young performer all the time. I want to be seen as a performer. I got past it very quickly because I, I never sold myself using that. I mean, I, I was consciously avoiding being labeled a young performer. And so now, I mean... I'm playing with the TSO for who knows what time, uh, and I just have a relationship with the musicians. I don't think they see me as a young musician anymore. It's just, you know, it's Jan. He's here. He's always been here, and and he'll be here for years to come, and that's that's the sort of relationship you also want to build with audiences, and I think I'm fairly successful with that. I think you are, too. I think that takes incredible maturity to want to get there because there are those who would be, well, you know what, I can make a couple of bucks off being, I mean, you could be you could be Mozart here, you know, what, what, what you know, you could be, there's no shortage of young performers who are labeled sure. young performers. But there. that's a very short-term strategy. And, yeah. And, I think the the important thing, maturity aside, is my parents also never pushed me into it, and they never wanted me to become a star of any sort. It was just an organic process and a natural path. So I'm glad to be here, but it's not, uh, actually, it's not quintessentially who I am, being a performer. I love music, I love a piano, and I like uh, sharing it with others, but it's not, doesn't define me as a person, I think. Do you mean uh, as a musician or as a person? Like as a person, as a person. I mean, if if of course I would be right now, I think it would be a great loss because I I love my life and I'm I'm very uh, satisfied and happy with the way it's it's developed. But um, if you took it away, I don't think I would be a different human being. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I mean that's that's that that takes something, man. Like there are people who I know what you mean. Like if, if I was 14 or 15 years old, though, and I got the acclaim that you did, I'm, it seems like you, you, you figured that out. Well, and I think that it, what helped me a lot, actually, is I really loved traveling, and I always did. So 
to me, my parents would joke that I wouldn't be really traveling to perform. I'd be performing to travel and to go <laughs> see the world. So the, the fact that I was able to go to Asia, to Europe, to South America at this young age um, because of piano was just so exciting. And I think, of course, I took my responsibility seriously and I'd prepared, but it, it's sort of still the same in many ways. Well, let, let's let's move off that for a second. Let's move off your age for a second. But let, let's, but let's talk about um, sort of how the industry's changed. Last time you were here, we talked a little bit about um, the expectations of audiences on, in, 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 in classical situations. I, and this time I'm interested in recording. Um, classical musicians, for, of course, have had fraught um, relations with recording since the dawn of recording. But I think, I wonder how things have changed now because... The days of buying CDs are ending. The days of buying vinyl records are, are ending, and everything seems to be streaming online. How are you reflecting on that change uh, from a classical perspective? It's a tough world to navigate, and I think because classical is um, a rather, I would say, small market uh, and very narrow. I mean, the the, int the the interest group of people who are actually very serious about loving classical music is small uh, and it's changed I think over the years because with <coughs> what what has happened I think a little bit with streaming is that a lot of the things that are getting the most streams are you know best of classical um, relaxing classical relaxing piano yeah relaxing yeah. piano or, or um, who knows symphonic highlights or something and yeah and the sometimes they're curated very well but often it's just you know a mishmash of whatever they grab together and and you have people who ha are doing nothing in the classical music but recorded something somewhere at some point on you know the top lists of some streaming service because they have the right track they released a CD and I think that's also a, a, a risk actually that's been um, present for years already is the releasing of popular classical music I always believe that it's a balance of the two. I'm bringing to light in my last recording Mendelssohn's music. Mendelssohn is a composer that's known, most certainly, but it isn't, you know, Beethoven Moonlight Sonata or something. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, that even classical music audiences don't hear it very often in concerts, these concertos. And actually, the, the response has been very positive, mm -hmm. and it's been a success on every front, but to push that through with a record label is not that easy because they would prefer to have something that is an easy sell, a quick sell. Have you felt that pressure to record a light classical? I have, and I've felt it for many years, and the approaches have been various, but I have always had a very strong backbone as far as what I want to record, and and I believe that recording is something that you should be happy with for your whole life uh, because the only value right now when everybody can go into a studio, I mean, there's no shortage of available places you can record and then you can release it yourself. It doesn't cost you very much yep, at all. Yep. Uh, then being with a label and recording as a serious artist should be something that means that what you've done is um, something special and not just something because, well, well whatever, it made sense at the time. Yeah, and, and you're right. You're, you're right we're losing that. And I think we're losing that especially in because in the music that I my, my stock and trade in, which is folk music or, or country music, I people can look up my band, right? Or they can look up my, my friends, they can find their music. One thing I find interesting about the way classical music is often categorized, especially online, is it's often by composer. Mm. So I, as a fan of, say, Bach or something yeah, like that, best you know, of Bach, yeah. I would I would say, oh, here's a Bach. I want to I want to hear the you know, I want to hear the Goldberg variations or something yeah. like that. I'll find a recording of it and I'll play it. And only, and this is, I mean, please don't roll your eyes too much. We need to, uh, we need to keep them in your head a little bit. But I didn't know for a long time that, oh my God, well, this I mean, Gould playing it versus this person playing it versus this person playing it is is completely different. And I wonder, as a classical artist, whether you're worried about that too. The homogenization is someone could just look up Mendelssohn, someone could just look up Bach or Chopin. You know, as long as they're able to find the good recordings but i mean that's that's the issue because as with uh, every issue facing society today how do we actually decide what's good because everybody has to hear it for themselves i'm not saying that because you've recorded with deutsche grammophon your recording will naturally be better than somebody who released it deutsche themselves. grammophon the biggest classical label in the world right yeah now. but, yeah. but it, i mean it, it it somebody who recorded at home something maybe had uh, absolutely shocking and 
innovative and great idea, and it sounds much better than any artist who's ever done it before. But how do we actually uh, rank that? And that's that's a big struggle. And and the other thing that actually moving off of that subject in streaming, the other problem is that uh, streaming lives off of short tracks and services such as Apple Music or uh, Spotify pay per track streamed, and classical music tracks are long. Right, right. So if, I mean, a movement of a symphony is 15 minutes, 20 minutes, easy. Yeah. So uh, that's really unfair when you have a one-minute tracks and then you have a 20-minute one, and I'm not saying that everybody listens through the entire symphony, but you've listened to 20 minutes of music, and the record maybe has four tracks, and you get paid uh, four cents instead of, you know, I don't know, 10 yeah. on, on the record. And some services like Adagio, uh, a very high quality classical music streaming service, actually pay per 30 seconds. Right. Uh, but I think that's that's a whole issue because what, what ends up where it ends up leading is that classical music labels also start to look at, oh, we need to record short things and we need to, you know, put them into short little capsules so right. that they can end up on you know the best of classical music, the best of Mendelssohn, the best of Chopin, the, uh, relaxing classical tracks, you know? <laughs> classical cafe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, right. I really, I really, really appreciate you talking to me about this. I haven't heard anyone um, speak to me about the the way the classical effects, um, streaming effects, classical music, uh, because I think a lot of the people I speak to about it came up in the CD and vinyl era. It's nice to see someone uh, talking to me a little bit about this. But I, I want to go back to something you said earlier, which is that, or something I said earlier, to be honest, which is that everyone kind of brings what they, brings themselves to a piece of music. And that's mm. that's maybe my favorite thing about classical music. You know, my favorite thing is hunting down, con like I like Beethoven's Seventh Symphony a lot, and I like hunting down each con conductor. You know, I like hunt hunting down. Yes, see. Uh, Seeing the orchestras and seeing the difference and seeing how they interpret it. So as you're about, you're, you're about to play some some Rachmaninoff, right? Yes. So like, what 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 do you think you bring, or what do you try to bring to a piece that that's you? I, it's hard. Again, here we are talking about music and words, and especially about myself and words. It's not an easy task. But I, what I love about classical music, and you're completely right, is that when an audience uh, becomes acquainted with the work, they are hungry for hearing more for hearing it again and for hearing a different take on it and of course um, perhaps the the slant is always to criticize but that means that they're interested that they're um, curious to hear a new version and and I think once you've heard something that stays with you forever once you've heard that magical performance that, that one that you were in awe completely you want to come back to the concert hall again and since we were talking about streaming and and recording as much as I believe strongly that it's important still to record, music is a live art, and being a part of that experience is what makes uh, my art special. And I hope simply to bring a sort of honest perspective. Um, I try to think of the composer's intentions, the music, uh, and I will, of course, infuse it with some personality of m my own thoughts, my own feeling. but. I never want to overpower the music. I don't want to use it as a vessel to demonstrate my own mm. uh, traits and m possibilities as a performer, but I want to showcase the genius of the composer mm -hmm. um, in my vision. So you did such a lovely job setting up variation series, the, the, the Mendelssohn piece, that I really understood it when you played it. Um, there's a, a really gifted radio host at CBC, Tom Allen, who's, mm -hmm. who's maybe the best at this, you know, like he he sets up pieces of classical music that I end up listening to like a podcast, like <laughs> about four minutes in, this thing's about to happen. And it's, it means freedom. And I'm like, I can't wait to hear it. Um, and I'm not asking you to do that, but can you can you set up a little bit of what we're about to hear with this piece by Rachmaninoff? It's a prelude, opus three, number two, and it, it's rather well known. Um, it's been nicknamed the Bells of Moscow. Uh, because it sounds like bells. Uh, and the way Rachmaninoff writes, it's a very early piece. He actually didn't, he was very unhappy that it became so popular because he thought that his uh, capabilities as a composer increased exponentially over time. And most certainly that's true. But as with any great composer, he was a genius from the start. Uh, and even though this is Opus 3, so very early in his writing, it, it's a masterpiece. And the way he uh, sets up the theme, the idea, the concept of, of these so-called bells uh, continues through a, a development of it, um, a lyrical passage work that builds up the tension and returns. And I think what I love most about it is how 
at the start you have a sort of calm vision of, of these bells. Uh, and by the end, it's not fervent, but it's, it's with this sort of um, anger, with a sort of pain, a suffering. Um, something that I think is unique to Rachmaninoff's music, he always had this sort of pain or suffering, the, this, emotion, this emotional journey. Uh, and once again, like in the Mendelssohn, he ends it uh, peacefully. That's, that's the most amazing thing, how he brings us down instead of, once again, ending with a splash. Uh, it, it ends calmly, introvertly, almost. Well, I can't wait to hear it uh, at your leisure.